Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. When I was 11, I would go to my friend Patrick's house in Yadkin County, North Carolina, and spend the weekend, sometimes the week, especially when it was summer. Like most kids, we played in an old hay barn that we had made our fort. This area was rolling, dried up cow pastures, and a few mud spots in the middle. A one-acre farm pond that was low and muddy. A five-strand barbed wire fence on two sides of it to keep the cattle out of the woods. While in the barn loft playing one day, we looked across the pasture toward the pond, and we saw a very hairy beast. It was down on all fours drinking water from our farm pond. This amazed us, as there was no cattle or horses in the pasture the whole time. At first, we just thought it was somebody's cow in need of water, as it was very hot that summer. My friend went to get a pair of binoculars to see what it was. Before he could leave, the thing stood up on its hind legs and walked back toward the woods. On its way, it stepped over a five-strand barbed wire fence. We just stood there, dumbfounded at what we had both just seen. It was a tall, biped, dark brown, almost black creature. I would say about eight feet tall after it stood up as it stepped over a five-strand barbed wire fence like it was nothing. I didn't go to look for tracks as I was scared stiff. After I heard the screeching sound that sounded almost like fingernails on a chalkboard. We never told anybody about this for several years, until recently when a deer hunter was hunting in the same area and claimed that he shot a deer, but before he could find it, he heard, in his words, the damnedest, scariest screeching he had ever heard in his entire life. When he got to the kill site, something had dragged his deer off, and he wasn't about to go looking for it. I've told my friend about it and a friend. I don't know the deer hunter's name. I hang out in a gun shop when I'm not working. I'm also a gunsmith. He was relating the story to a man there, and I was listening in. Now you know my story. On to the next one. In Pascatank County in North Carolina. I was about 17 at the time of the sighting. It was in the fall around October. First of all, I should start by letting you know that I am what you would call a city boy, scared and out of place in the woods. A friend of mine had invited me to go deer hunting with his father and him on a large parcel of private property they owned in North Carolina. I'm willing to try anything, so I went. This property was set back away from the closest road about a half a mile on foot before you even got to the cabins they owned. These cabins were on stilts, like a beach house about 10 feet high with stairs. For what reason, I have no idea, although we were next to a small inland waterway. At about 5 a.m. in the morning, we proceeded to go hunting, my friend taking me to my deer stand and moving on to there. This deer stand was about 10 feet high in a tree, I did see many deer and a black bear that day, but I didn't have the heart to shoot them. I guess at about 9 a.m., my sighting began with a bad smell. It smelled worse than a dog that had been playing in a sewer. Then, I heard it before I saw it. It snapped twigs as it walked. At first, I thought it was my friend and his dad come to rescue me from this ordeal. I only saw it from the waist up, from a distance of about 50 yards. And if it knew I was there, it didn't care. It stood in one spot for a good five minutes, eating leaves, so I got a good look at it. Having seen a bear earlier that day, there is absolutely no way 
this could be a case of mistaken identity. This creature had hands like a human that plucked the leaves it was eating and looked very fussy about the ones it wanted. They looked dark black in color and relatively hairless except for the back of the hand was hairy. It looked to be about eight feet tall, just unbelievably massive in the chest and shoulders. Its fur was very dark black in color. I only caught glimpses of its face as its back was to me and it looked hairy except around the eyes. The neck was short and stubby, kind of like a furry ridge that ran up the back of the neck to the top of what looked like a slightly pointed head that sloped down to the forehead like a gorilla. I saw in the DC Zoo. When I lost sight of it, I could still hear it crunch sticks and leaves as it walked on its way for about five more minutes. Needless to say, I was so scared I almost peed myself, waiting quietly for my friends to come save me. When they arrived, I told them the story, and of course, they thought it was a bear. I haven't told the story to many people because of the ridicule I received from the manly men of the woods that day. It was about 9 a.m. in a semi-rural area. The area is woodland, along with some swamps. Deer and various wildlife frequent these areas. The Atlantic Ocean is only a few miles away. On to the next one. In Henderson County in North Carolina, we were driving back to Wisconsin after spring break in Daytona Beach in mid-April. We had dropped off a friend who was in the Navy in Charleston. We were driving through North Carolina on a route past Asheville. I think we were on the 26th near Hendersonville. I had been driving for about five hours and was in the hills definitely. It was about 2 to 3 a.m. and it happened very fast a small, four to five foot brown shaggy creature with a very pointed head crossed in front of the car. Its arms were swinging. It was moving fast and it was close. I hit the brakes hard, locking them up and putting the car into a skid. I just missed the thing. This jarred my two friends awake who were, of course, sleeping. I told them, that I had just seen a Jawa walking in front of the car. I guess my brain just couldn't reconcile what I was seeing, so Jawa popped in. I thought it was wearing a brown robe with a hood. I chalked it up to seeing things and kept driving. But the more I go over my reaction, the more I feel like it was really there. I've had deer jump out in front of my car and surprise me, and I've reacted the same by hitting the brakes with no delay. It was not like some foggy apparition slowly appearing in front of the car. This thing was there and gone in a second or two. The other two people in the car were sleeping. It was around 2 to 3 a.m. On to the next one. In Onslow County in North Carolina... I was recently married and stationed at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Neither my wife nor I had been to Wilmington, North Carolina before, so one Saturday we made a day trip to Wilmington. We saw some sights, did some shopping, had dinner, and went to a late movie. While driving back to Camp Lejeune, just north of the town of Holly Ridge, I noticed a very large figure on the right shoulder ahead. It was walking upright, and I assumed it was a bear. I slowed down in order to avoid hitting it should it go down on all four legs and flee. I was going perhaps 10 miles per hour or a bit less. When I finally realized what I was approaching was not a bear, the creature I saw was massive, maybe 7 to 8 feet tall, and I'd estimate 600 pounds or more. The hair was a lighter brownish color and appeared long in its length. I could see its face very clearly. What struck me at the time, and even to this day, is that the creature appeared to be oblivious to his surroundings 
and seemed deep in thought. It never gave any indication that he was aware of the car approaching, nor did the bright headlights seem to cause it discomfort. It just kept moving along at a slow pace, looking straight ahead. I finally passed the creature at nearly walking speed. I assumed I had to have been mistaken or could not have seen what I thought I had, so I stopped the car. I looked back out the rear window and could see the creature still walking southbound in the glow of the stop lamps of the car. I woke up my wife and had her look. She did look, but said it must have been a bear. At that point, I let it go and resumed my northbound trip back to Jacksonville. One other thing to note is that my impression was that the creature was clean in the sense that its hair was not matted nor in tufts. The hair was straight and laid flat against its body and seemed to vary in length from a couple of inches to maybe five inches. There was no hair on the face, which was a bit lighter in complexion than the fur surrounding it. It was about 1 a.m. on a Sunday morning on a paved two-lane highway with wide, soft shoulders on each side pine forest to both the east and west sides of the highway. It was clear and the temperature fair. My wife was sleeping in the passenger seat of the car. I woke her up just after passing the creature. She could see the figure in the brake light, but said it had to have been a bear. I never discussed the incident with anyone for years afterwards, assuming it would be dismissed out of hands as having seen a bear. To this day, I've only ever related the incident to very few people. On to the next one. I was dating this guy named Travis at the time. He was one of those types who seemed to live off frequent adrenaline rushes. Well, it's pretty darn hard for me to imagine a more intense thrill than what I went through on our final date. Travis showed up at my front doorstep with flowers and asked if I wanted to go mudding. If you're not familiar with the activity, it's where you take an off-road vehicle into muddy terrain and drive like a psychopath. Well, that's what we did, only that was far from the most worrisome part of the day. I'm going to show you a secret, Travis said, with a grin when we were only a few minutes from the scene. He didn't elaborate any further than that, so I assume he was referring to the location of where we were headed. I never would have guessed what he truly meant by that. We ended up in this open field that had lots of fallen trees everywhere. It was a cloudy, gloomy day, and I remember thinking that the sky looked like it wasn't long before a severe storm came through this area. Let's maybe head back before bad weather, I suggested. But Travis responded with yet another vague statement. Not before I show you something that'll change your life, he muttered with confidence. It wasn't long after that, he parked his Jeep Wrangler near the edge of the woods and stepped around to the vehicle's rear. He then opened the trunk and extracted something heavy from the back. I was still sitting in the passenger seat so I couldn't see what he was tampering with. He started tossing items toward the edge of the wood, which I soon recognized as slabs of meat. What are you doing that for? I called out, very weirded out by his action. The truth is, I was actually thinking about breaking up with him, and the strangeness of this event wasn't doing much to help reverse that intent. It was only after a few minutes after Travis re-entered his vehicle that it emerged from the woods. Initially, I thought it was an ogre or a troll or something. The size alone made it impossible for it to be a mere human in a costume. Oh my god, I gasped before covering my mouth out of fear of this ugly thing noticing me. Of course, we were in plain view, but I didn't want to draw any extra attention my way. That visual of the creature crumbled my reality. Looking at it made my brain feel as though it were short-circuiting. It just didn't make any sense. How could it be? To make matters worse, Travis stepped on the gas pedal 
bringing us closer to the ugly giant. What are you doing? I murmured, acknowledging that getting closer to this thing was the most undesirable thing I could imagine. But Travis didn't reply. Instead, he swerved to the left of the beast after it had started examining one of the meat packages. That caused mud to spray all over its light brown fur. Oh my God, what is wrong with you? I couldn't help but scream at Travis. And it was so obnoxious how he maintained that same cocky grin. The beast, that I now know to be a Bigfoot, unleashed a snarl right before chasing after us. By the time I turned around, it was already down on all fours, scrambling toward us. It moved in a way that reminded me of a crab, only much, much faster. And even over the sound of Travis's engine, I could hear the beast making these bizarre gurgling noises. It made it sound like its lungs led to an endless abyss. I wish someone could clarify for me how that works. I'm not sure I'm elaborating on that properly. It's probably one of those things you have to experience to get the gist. The ride had become so turbulent by this point, and I'm so thankful that I took the initiative to buckle my seatbelt because otherwise I for sure would have gotten launched from the vehicle. Can you believe it? Travis shouted as he glanced at me with an excited look. The beast wasn't even that far off from us because my idiot driver was swerving all over. Can you even imagine what would have happened had the vehicle tipped? or the engine had broken down. We both would have gotten ripped to pieces. I remember thinking how just the forearms on this creature looked wider than the Jeep's off-road tires. It had to have had incredible strength. Get us out of here, I shouted, now more afraid than I ever thought possible. Travis looked at me like he was hurt. It was a look that conveyed that he was letting me in on something intimate, secret, and... I was rejecting him for it, but all I could think about was getting as far away from that place as possible. It very much felt like we had intruded on some psycho's property, only that psycho just happened to be an actual monster that I never before thought existed. I was finally able to breathe a sigh of relief when I noticed the beast had stopped trailing us. Once we started driving in a straight line, it seemed to recognize it couldn't catch up to us. Regardless, I think it just really wanted the noisy vehicle to go away so it could tend to the meat slab undisturbed. How long have you known that thing is over there? I said after we arrived back on the main road. You're not going to go telling anyone about that, are you? He said, disregarding my question. He then had a look in his eyes like he was worried he had made a colossal mistake. The audacity he must have had to think that he could expose that monster, risk my life, and then expect for me not to tell anyone was more than foolish. Are you out of your mind? I said, fuming. You so easily could have gotten us both killed. What even was that thing? My uncle thinks it's a Sasquatch, Travis replied, now with a much more serious tone. A Sas what? I remarked, never having heard the word before. That probably sounds strange, given I'm from Washington, but I'd never before expressed any interest in that kind of stuff. Frankly, the subject of cryptids flew way under my radar. A Sasquatch, Travis repeated. You could say it's another word for Bigfoot. The whole experience felt so out of nowhere that I ended up at a loss for words. Look, you can't tell anyone about this, Travis then said, breaking the brief period of silence. My family would kill me. I now wish I would have asked him to elaborate further on that, but I was so upset with the guy for risking my life that I just wanted to get away from him. I broke up with him after he dropped me off at my house and I was shaken up for probably a week after. I told my parents all about what happened, but I never felt like they fully believed my perception of it. It felt like they were a bit condescending, that irritated me because it made me feel like I was talking to a wall. I had nobody to vent to about the matter. There was no way I would tell my friend group about it because they never in a million years would believe me. They were the types of girls who might have even disowned me over such a claim 
then spread nasty rumors about me. That whole debacle made me appreciate what so many other people must go through. Like honestly, who do you tell about these encounters to? After I got older, I stopped feeling insecure about telling people, and I wrote to a few networks that broadcast Bigfoot-related content. I never heard back from any of them, which leads me to suspect that maybe they don't take the subject as seriously as some people think. Sometimes I even wonder if people that share their encounter stories on those shows are all actors. Otherwise, how does the network even find those people? So many of them claim to be from the middle of nowhere. The chances of them getting in touch with TV studios seems pretty slim. On to the next one. I've always thought that the Smoky Mountain Range is one of the eeriest places I've been to, and that feeling took on a whole new meaning in late summer. I had taken an excellent job in Asheville, North Carolina, but it wasn't long before the demanding workload led me toward some unhealthy habit. In a nutshell, I was eating poorly, rarely working out, and had started regularly smoking cigarettes because I was convinced they kept me energized throughout the day. It wasn't until my sister Hannah, who came to visit me, that I acknowledged how much weight I had gained. She was very blunt about it and went as far as to tell me I looked like a different person, not at all in a good way. I felt hurt when she said it, but I thank Hannah for the much-needed wake-up call. It was because of Hannah's harsh words that I began hiking every other day. But I didn't just stick to the trails. I would venture into the thicket so that I would have to push through whatever the environment presented. Some people might think that's a bit unnecessary, but I saw it as a way to jumpstart a healthier lifestyle. I wanted to struggle. I figured the harder I worked, the quicker the weight would fall off me. Anyhow, I was a few months into my new regime when I spotted something strange from afar. Fortunately, I was high on a ridge, and the figure was maybe 60 feet below me. That probably sounds way too close to some people, but it could have been a heck of a lot worse. At first glance, I thought this thing was an overgrown chimpanzee. Of course, I knew those animals weren't native to North America, but I assumed this one had either escaped a zoo or the confines of some rich person's backyard. It wasn't long before that assumption went right out the window. As soon as this creature turned its head slightly to the left, its facial features made it known that this was no chimpanzee. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. Suddenly, I was overcome by this feeling that I wasn't supposed to be anywhere near that area. It felt a bit like I was trespassing and one of the worst things that could happen would be for me to get caught. It was the most unusual sensation I had ever felt. I now think it was because I was in the presence of one of the world's greatest predators. Because of that unsettling feeling, I slowly began backing away. I thought I'd already gotten lucky with the creature somehow not noticing me, and I didn't want to push that by turning and making tons of noise. I was so thankful that its back was turned when I arrived. I had only maybe taken around four small steps backward when I suddenly felt like my breath had been taken away from me in an instant. The cracking noise from stepping on a stick seemed to echo for miles. I would have gulped when the creature spun its gaze and locked eyes with me, but it was as if I no longer possessed the strength even for that. There was something so peculiar about making eye contact with the creature, making the experience feel so much more real than it had only a few moments earlier. We were a reasonable distance apart, but the look in its eyes is something I'll never forget. For just a moment, I had the impression that it was more worried about me seeing it than about it seeing me, but that quickly changed. Soon, the creature formed a shape with its lips that was unlike anything I have seen from a human. As I attempt to mimic it while I write this, it quickly becomes evident that our facial muscles can't accomplish it. While the creature did this, 
It revealed the upper row of yellowish brown teeth. I thought they looked pretty similar to typical human teeth, only larger to match the size of its massive jowls. Even though the peculiarity caused me to feel trapped for some time, it couldn't have been more than a brief few seconds before it emanated the noise that reminded me of samurai chatter. That must come off as such an unusual way of putting it, but believe me when I tell you that everything about this situation was unpredictable, and the encounter immediately proved to me just how little we know about these creatures. My mind was having so much difficulty processing nearly everything about this situation, but shortly after that, my mind was forced to only care about getting away. After uttering its strange language, the creature hurled a good-sized rock my way. It landed a few feet before me, causing the dust to burst onto my sneakers and lower pant legs. The creature then vanished from my sight, but I knew it was climbing up the ridge toward me based on the direction it had gone. Finally, I regained enough control over my muscles to turn and make a run for it. From there on out, all I did was focus on the ground in front of me, paying careful attention to not lose my balance or trip on the treacherous terrain. My ears managed to do a fine job of alerting me that the creature was indeed following me, but the sound of the sporadic samurai-like chatter never once seemed to be very close, and eventually the noise altogether stopped, leaving me to listen to my thumping heart and lungs gasping for air. I barely remember that drive home. I barely recall arriving at my car. It didn't seem like it was until later that night that I started to come to. It was as though I had finally began to come out of a dream, although I know I wasn't asleep for it. There was an uncanny resemblance to how it feels when you're amid a strange and terrifying dream. For example, even though I've never much believed in ghosts, I'd be lying if I claimed not to have horrifying nightmares about them. I'll sporadically dream where I think I'm alone in my home or someone else's home and a specter then approaches me. Well, my Sasquatch encounter felt very akin to that, only it actually occurred. I implore you to keep a watchful eye when you're out exploring in our forest, especially when you're out there by yourself. On to the next one. Between Three Lakes and Tioga in Barga County in Michigan, the following is a letter written to the Mining Journal in May of 2008. Bigfoot, Loch Ness. A few weeks ago, in your Sunday editorial page, you ran a letter in reference to Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, etc., which I am sure some people might think is out of the question for anywhere in the U.S., let alone in the Great Upper Peninsula. Well, I have an honest-to-God true story to tell, and then let your readers decide how possibly there might be a Bigfoot in our very own area. One night, about 38 years ago, my sister-in-law and I went to visit a friend in Three Lakes. On our way home, I was driving, and not but a few miles from our friend's home, which was on the highway, upon the arisen to the left, this massive white creature came to the top of the hill, and we looked at each other in disbelief as to what we were seeing. We said to one another, Oh my God! What the heck is that? We all freaked out. I slowed some and kept looking at this huge, white, furry creature looking down towards us. We just kept repeating to ourselves as to what we were seeing. I could understand some people saying, oh yeah, they were drinking. Maybe so, but all we drank were numerous cups of coffee as we visited our friend as we drove in a rather hurried pace, rather shook up, we sped. Unknown to myself at the time, I had passed a police car and didn't realize it until we saw the emblem on the door. My sister-in-law said, my gosh, now we passed a cop to boot. We kept talking all the way home, wondering and questioning ourselves as to what we saw 
and, if it was possible, that it truly was this giant, white, furry Bigfoot, as we like to call it. We have told numerous people our story, and everyone kind of just says, yeah, right, and laughs at us. But we would stake our lives on this story, and will go to our graves knowing what we saw was Bigfoot. On to the next one. In Delta County on the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, the landmass north of the Mackinac Bridge extending west meeting Wisconsin, dense woods or forest with elevation jumps with many streams and Lake Michigan close by, the nearest city would be Escanaba. It was explained as the creature with bear-like hair. It walked upright with a very smooth glide and stood about seven and a half feet tall with massive shoulder width. It acted not violent and non-interested. This was not my sighting, but one explained to me by a friend, Will, his father and uncle, took him and his cousin from Bay City, Michigan, up to the Upper Peninsula for their first big hunting trip away from home. They were staying at this remote cabin out in the deep woods. They planned to wake up early to arrive at their hunting positions before sunrise. They left the cabin at roughly 5.30 a.m. and were driving slowly along a rough dirt road with ditches along the side of the road. Suddenly, my friend's cousin said from the passenger seat, looking to his right, Dad, Dad, look at the bear. Look at the bear. My friend's uncle slowed the vehicle and slightly wheeled it over to put the light on the boy's excitement. At that moment, all four people in the vehicle saw what appeared to be a bear crawling through the shallow ditch when suddenly the creature stood upright and walked out of the ditch, crossing the road in front of the vehicle and smoothly vanished within the darkness on the other side of the road. Both youngsters were desperate for answers and very rattled. The father wasn't much better, which only added to the fright of the youngsters. My friend's uncle said to his brother, What on God's earth was that we just saw? The hunting trip was over. It was never said, but it seemed none of the hunters were very excited about trekking through the same terrain as that unexplainable animal. My friend also told me, that over the years that this incident had been kept very quiet among the four individuals. His father told all before they left the cabin for home that it was best to shut our mouths rather than try to explain to others what we have seen and have these people ridicule and damage our names. The elders decided that it was an experience that one would have to go through to have the same reaction or even a possible belief of the tale. I feel privileged to have had this story told to me, and I truly believe my friend, who is not one to tell of false tales, or even talk much for that matter. On to the next one. This happened in Barga County in Michigan. I was about 14 years old, riding a Honda on Petticoat Lake Road between Brent Lake Road and Imperial Heights. I was exploring back roads and found an old grown overdrive and followed it. I later discovered it led to a clearing where there was an abandoned cabin back then. Today, there is a camp on that road. The road was so overgrown, I had to put it in slow. I could barely keep the bike up. After clearing the thick brush, the road opened up and I could see quite far under the canopy of trees. About 30 yards in front of me, a Bigfoot ran from my left to right. He ran like a man at full speed. My first thought was that a man in a gorilla costume was running through the woods. My next thought was that no man would be running through the woods in a gorilla costume, especially way back in the woods where I was. I immediately spun the bike around and took off at full throttle, bending foot pegs and mirrors. 
I can still see him clear as a bell running through the forest at full stride. Possibly this was a young Bigfoot because it was not lumbering, but cruising through the woods at full stride like a Bigfoot track star. It was a lot of years before I went back in the woods as much. My father has heard very strange wailing while back in that area. It was a beautiful, sunny day deep in the hardwood forest. There was not much undergrowth at that point. On to the next one. In McMillan Township near Newberry in Luce County, Michigan. While snowmobiling in a remote area of the country in which I live, I noticed somewhat ahead of me someone had walked and left this trail of footprints or tracks in the snow. Right away, I thought this was unusual, as people do not venture into this marshy area. Now, this was the third week of February, and that winter, we had a very heavy fall of snow, and the depth of the snow in that area was around 30 inches. I was able to snowmobile, as the snow had a very hard crust on the surface, solid enough to support the weight of the snow machine without breaking through. So I drove right up on the trail made by something and stopped and looked down at them. Then I realized these were not black bear tracks of one coming out of hibernation early or some other person on snowshoes or any other familiar thing. These were human barefoot tracks. The impression left in the snow by whatever walked through there was perfect. The heel mark, the toes, the way the feet taper from width in the front to narrow by the heel, and that when the hair on the back of my neck stood up. A barefoot giant had walked through here. I saw those prints, and a real fear came over me. And at that time, I had never heard of Bigfoot. I had heard of Yeti in the Himalayas and Sasquatch in the Pacific Northwest, but never Bigfoot. I got out of there in a hurry. The incident occurred at about 3 p.m. in good light. In spite of being slightly overcast with the wind out of the northwest, it was a marshy area with sand ridges of jack pine, Norway pine, and white pine growth on them. This, in the early spring, is the floodplain of the Taquamenon River, which is very close to the trail left by Bigfoot. About two years later, I heard of a story of people coming across tracks, the soft mud of a lake in Rexton, Michigan area, a community about 25 miles southeast of Newberry. As I recall, this incident even resulted in a mention in our local newspaper, the Newberry News, but I did not save the article, nor do I remember exactly what it said. Then there was a Mr. Fair of Newberry, Michigan, now deceased who, while picking blueberries in the side of a hill, looked up toward the top of the hill, and there was a Bigfoot at the top of the hill looking down at him. He did not tell the year or where the sighting took place. Also, a friend who lived in Curtis, Michigan, while fishing on a remote lake of Feeney, Michigan, came across giant human footprints in the sand of that lake shore. On to the next one. In Marquette County, south of Big Bay, east of Country Road 550, it was on the shore of Lake Superior and surrounding woods. The first incident. When I was about seven years old, we were at Lake Superior on the beach. We found a set of footprints in the sand. They were very large. My parents said they were a lot larger than a normal footprint would have been, even for an adult. When you're seven, anything would seem big. Later, when we were leaving, we heard a screeching that sounded similar to a screech owl or a primate at a zoo. This is the best I can describe it. A very large something also started jumping up and down fairly close to us. We were in the woods near the lake, almost to the car at the time. We couldn't see what it was, but it didn't appear to want us around. My mom thought it may have been college students playing a prank or on drugs. It was too big for that. I wanted to go see what it was, but my parents wouldn't let me. 
we left in the car quickly. A few days later, there was an article in the Mining Journal, a local newspaper, that some guy and his girlfriend saw Bigfoot on an old road in the same area. There may have been more than one critter screeching in the Big Bay Area incident. It's been so many years, I'm not really sure. My parents might remember. But the more I think about it, I seem to remember a group making the screeches and then one coming closer to us. Also, my mom's friend's relative or friend or something like that, you know, small town, knows the guy who saw the critter on the road who told the mining journal. The second incident. Many years later, I was returning home from a long bicycle tour. I was traveling between Munising and Marquette on M28. I had already rode about 110 miles and was dead tired. This area is extremely isolated with lots of nothing. I decided to stop and camp. Who cares if the sleeping bag was wet from the previous bad weather? I was beat. I was in a sort of a low area of gully on the highway when I stopped to pitch the tent. Something let out a screech from the woods. I don't know what it was, but it sounded a lot like the thing from the Big Bay area. Believe me, I suddenly got enough energy to pedal the additional 40 miles to home. I don't know if it was just an animal or otherwise. I do believe this is worth mentioning as it sounded similar and I was in an extremely desolate area. Still, it could have been some other type of critter so I'm not claiming this to be a definite sighting in any way. I never talked about this to anyone outside of my family for fear of being considered a nutcase. The Big Bay Area was extremely isolated, except for County Road 550 and some camps and dirt roads in the area. This area has been somewhat more populated in the last 25 years, but overall it is still pretty desolate. Lake Superior shoreline with many swamps, ponds, lakes, rivers in the general area. Thick woods of varying types, hardwood, pine, etc. There is an abandoned R&R grade tree that used to run between Marquette and Big Bay further inland. A few small towns used to exist in this area years ago. Actually, they were usually nothing more than a few houses or logging camps. There is next to nothing left of them. The film Anatomy of a Murder from the 1950s was partially shot on location in Big Bay. In the movie, it's called Thunder Bay. The movie was shot here as it was based on a true story. This is a rugged country with lots of hills in the area. Reports of cougar being sighted have happened numerous times in this general area over the last few years. Cougars stay away from people. I'm not sure if the DNR acknowledges them still being up here. They usually say someone mistook a bobcat. Needless to say, the locals know better. Munising and Marquette, M28. This section of the road is quite similar to my description of the Big Bay area. There have been more camps and houses built in the area since then, but it is still quite isolated. The majority of the building done along the superior shoreline for its value as waterfront property, the inland area is quite isolated. On to the next one. My two brothers and I were out camping in the woods at our favorite spot. We kind of found it by accident when we were little, when our dad took us out there during one of our trips. It became our unofficial camping site from that point. It's a clearing in the National Forest, but it's not a place you could find if you're faint of heart. We're very experienced in the woods, which made it perfect for us, even though we couldn't go out there all that often anymore. My brothers and I, we still went there every once in a while when we could manage to still get together for old time's sake. It was late at night, and we had built a fire. We were just sitting there talking for some time when I thought I heard noises like something moving up ahead of me in the nearby trees, but just out of range of the firelight. We looked there and I thought I saw the outline of something tall standing there looking at us. Something was off, but 
I thought it was possible for it to be someone who got lost. My brothers didn't agree with me and kept saying that something wasn't right because he just stood there. He didn't approach us. We called out to him, but he ignored us and moved back into the trees instead where we couldn't see him anymore. But he didn't keep going. I mean, he made noises, walking a couple of steps back into the trees. But then it felt like he didn't leave, but just stopped there. We were all fairly sure, whoever it was, he was hiding in there, in the trees. I can count with the fingers on one hand the number of times we came across another person that far out in the woods like that before, in all the times we went out there. It isn't to say it couldn't happen, but it just didn't happen. It wasn't a usual occurrence for us, and I didn't like the thought that someone was there and hid from us like that, you know? Since we even called out to them, and they obviously knew we knew they were there. I didn't take it as a good sign about their possible intentions that they hid and didn't either answer us back or leave the area. And I thought it was someone that wanted to attack or steal from us. My brothers and I, all three of us, were armed. But you just can't shoot. You have to make sure you don't shoot someone. I mean, it could be someone drunk or messing with us, or it could be someone lost and in need of help. But who's going to be messing around with us out there so late at night? I didn't think it would be someone messing around, but I had to make sure they weren't actually up to something. I got up and walked closer to the trees with my gun, drawn to shine my flashlight on what I still believed at that time was somebody hiding in the trees. When I got close, the smell of wet dog hit me like a blast out of nowhere. Then I heard movement up ahead and saw something move behind a tree just as I found it with a light. I saw a head sticking out from behind the tree and then I knew it wasn't another man like I thought it was. I stood there dumbfounded, at a total loss for words. I expected to see a person, but I saw a long snout and then its teeth as this thing curled its lips up and snarled at me. I backed up in the direction of my brothers and the fire, my flashlight and gun both still aimed at it, and it came out from behind the trees and followed me. It snarled at me the whole way. I couldn't make sense of what I saw. There was no question it was a wolf. It looked exactly like a wolf, but it stood and walked on two legs. There was no way for me to understand what I saw, none. Not only was it a wolf on two legs, it was muscular and taller than me. I'm six foot three and still had to look up to meet its eyes. It was not something I ever envisioned myself seeing at any time in my life. I had not even considered the possibility of having this happen out there. There was no way to make any sense of it. If my brothers hadn't been there with me to back up what I saw, I could convince myself I dreamed the whole thing up. I got my facts and memories mixed up, but no, they saw it. I saw it. We know what we saw. It had the black coat, pointed ears, head, fangs, eyes of a wolf. It was much bigger and looked heavier than any wolf I ever saw, but it was still a wolf, not a black bear standing on two legs. Believe me when I say I know the difference. It showed me its huge canines and walked towards me on two legs looking at me all angry like it wanted to tear me apart. I was focused on it. I couldn't look away from its eyes. It had yellow-orange eyes. But what stood out to me was there was so much rage and malice in its eyes. Let me just say that I'm not a guy who scares easily. I faced bears, but this thing terrified me in a way no other event in my life ever did. Nothing ever scared me like it did or made me feel like I was seconds away from being killed the way this thing made me feel. I knew without hesitation, without the shadow of a doubt, that it wanted us dead. I aimed my gun, but heard one of my brothers fire warning shots before I could even do anything. It didn't stop. It was not a man wearing a costume to mess around with us. Otherwise, 
he would have made that clear right then. The joke would have been over. Instead, it got closer, and both me and my brother fired more shots and hit it in the stomach area. It ran back into the woods that time, and it ran on two legs. We shone our flashlights in the direction it ran. I tried so hard to track it with the light, but it moved so fast, I couldn't keep up with it. When you find yourself dead set focused on something like that, and you try with all your might and all your concentration to find it somewhere out there in front of you, it has all your attention. You're trying very hard to locate it. The last thing you think about is that there's another one that sneaked up on you from behind. We heard the growling behind us, turned around, and saw there was another one. It would have gotten us, but the growling gave it away. That was the only clue, the only thing to indicate that it was there at all. There was no other noise or any other sounds of movement behind us. It looked exactly like the first one, but even bigger. I don't know if that was just the same one, but I don't think it could have run that fast to get behind us, and it was bigger. It also didn't have any wounds on it where we shot the first one. This one also walked on two legs. It was close to my brother and caught us by surprise. He was caught off guard, and before he had time to fire at it, my other brother let loose and shot it in the head. It ran back into the trees, and we heard it run off into the distance. Then we didn't hear it. We didn't hear any more. That was enough. We got all of our stuff together and got out. We weren't staying there that night. Back to the truck was nerve-wracking. I told you, I don't scare easily. Plenty of noises happen out there in the woods, but I don't jump at them. After what we just went through... I jumped at every noise on the way back. Every noise scared us and had us on edge. We made it back to the trucks without further incident, though. We never went camping out there. We didn't talk about it to each other for a long time. It's been a long time since then, but trying to get over what happened is still difficult for me. I've had nightmares ever since. I've tried very hard to put it out of my mind to forget. There is now a deep dread of going out in the woods that I feel now that I never had before as far as I can remember. Honestly, I haven't gone back camping at all since then, and neither have my brothers. We all have families. I just don't think it's worth it to put my family at risk of not having a husband or a father there anymore by getting killed out there in the woods by something like that. I tried to find information that could help me understand what I experienced, but it wasn't any good. I wanted to talk about it with someone, someone who knew what those things I saw out there were, and who had real knowledge of them. I really did, but I didn't go talking about it to anyone. I'm not able to go back in the woods to look for them. Before I saw them, I didn't believe any stories of things like that. I understand if people don't believe what I say happened, life is like that, but I don't care if someone else believes me or not. I know what I saw, and my brothers know what they saw. We know what we saw out there in the woods that night. On to the next one. My dad told me this story when I was just a kid, and it scared the life out of me. It actually made me afraid to go out in the woods alone. One day, years after he had told it, I mentioned the effect it had on me, and he said he was very sorry to have scared me. We talked about it for a long time, and I'm convinced he was being honest about what happened. He was a very straightforward man with a lot of integrity. He did say he knew these creatures were real, and maybe he had told me the story out of concern for my safety, although unintentionally. Anyway, here's the story, and I'll just tell it like I remember him telling it. My dad went to school in a one-room schoolhouse since he was born in 1930. I would guess this happened in about 1940, as he said he was in fifth or sixth grade. That would make him around 11 or 12 years old. 
not so young that he couldn't recall it all pretty clearly. The old schoolhouse sat on a piece of land, maybe an acre that had been donated by a local rancher who wanted a place to send his kids to school. The locals had built the school, and it was just a single room with a big wood stove and about 10 desks, maybe 15, but not a lot. It had a little back room for storing wood, as well as being a place for the kids to take off their coats and boots. It was also the entrance. The school had been built from local wood, probably some kind of pine from higher up in the mountains. The school sat near a tiny town called Hamilton, which had maybe 30 residents and was positioned at the bottom of a small valley where the Williams Fork River flowed through. I think the town has actually lost most of its residents in the past 30 years or so. This was in northwestern Colorado, which is mostly sagebrush and canyon county, with uplands having lots of scrub oak, then aspen, and pine higher up. There are mountains, but they're not the jagged kind you see in other parts of the state, but mostly just giant hills with rugged terrain. Few people ever went up into the hills, except to hunt, and I think it's still that way. This was ranching country, with the lowlands along the river used for hayfields and winter pasture, and the higher country up in the aspens used for summer grazing. But there weren't a lot of ranches, as it took a lot of land to make a go of it. The town kids walked to school, but the ranch kids all rode horses, and there was a small corral near the school building. The kids would take the horses down to the nearby river for water. The Williams Fork River isn't a big river, but more like a large, wide stream and pretty shallow in most places. I used to inner tube it as a kid when I'd go visit my grandparents' ranch. Anyway, my dad and his younger sister, who everyone called the kid, rode to school every day on an old quarter horse they nicknamed Nolly, who was old and pretty much retired, except to haul the kids around. The ranch was about two miles up the road from the school. These ranch kids were pretty tough and used to doing things on their own since they were little, and they sure weren't coddled. My dad said that one day in the spring, he and the kid had just come into the little inner room of the school and were taking off their boots when a little town girl came in and was scared and crying. My dad asked her what was wrong and she said there was a big gorilla in the willows by the river watching her and it had followed her to school. My dad went outside and looked around, but he didn't see anything. As he was out there, the teacher, Miss Thomas, came out. The little girl had told her the same story. They looked around, but neither of them saw a thing. My dad always took Nolly down to the river for a drink before the ride home, and he said that later that afternoon, when school was out, when he tried to take her down there, she wouldn't go. He figured she wasn't thirsty, though that was unusual for her. He went back up to the school and got the kid, and then the pair started for the ranch. They rode double down the dirt road that went through the valley and paralleled the thick willows along the river. As they were riding along, all of a sudden, Nolly just took off with them, kind of run away, heading for the ranch. She had never done this before, and there was nothing my dad could do to get her to stop. She took them right up to the door of the ranch house, when normally they would go to the barn and unsaddle her, let her out to pasture, then walk to the house. My grandma was there and wondered why Nolly was so lathered up. The kids weren't supposed to ride her hard since she was old. My dad told my grandma what had happened, but he neglected to mention the big gorilla at the school as he had forgotten all about it. Nolly wanted to stay up at the house close to them, and they couldn't get her back to the barn. So my grandma just unsaddled her there and gave her some water and let her graze on the lawn. She would let my grandpa deal with it when he got in from the field where he'd been checking on some cattle that were calving. Well, when he came in, Nolly was fine and he put her out to pasture. They had no idea what had been wrong, but later that night, they got an inkling when the cattle started making a commotion. 
Calving season is the worst time for ranchers, as cows often need assistance and predators can be a problem. It can be a grueling and sleepless time. When my grandpa heard the cattle carrying on, he grabbed his rifle and a spotlight and headed out for the pasture. He knew either coyotes or a cougar were in the area for the cattle tack like that. The first thing he noticed was the strong odor. It smelled like something indescribable and made him want to throw up. It was really strong and was coming from the direction of the cows. He had his cow dog Lucy and Sam with him and when they got to the pasture gate they turned around and hightailed it back to the house. This was a first for them as they were usually the ones that took off chasing and they'd even chased off a cougar one. My grandfather stopped and thought about this. It made him nervous so he got his rifle and fired off a few rounds into the air then proceeded to go see what was going on. As he started in here came the cattle, pretty much stampeding, and this was bad, as some had tiny calves that no way could keep up with them. My grandfather went back to the house and got my dad and my uncle as he needed reinforcements. They all had flashlights, and they went out into the pasture and started walking around, seeing what was going on and looking for a cab. After a bit, the cattle all started coming back around, and the moms were returning with their calves who were bawling their heads off by then. It looked like everyone was there and okay, except the excitement had caused one cow to go into labor and she looked like she was having a hard time. My dad went back inside, but his older brother stayed out to help. Pulling a calf is hard work, and if they had to take this route, my grandfather could use his help. Well, it wasn't long before the calf was born, and they had taken it and the mom into the barn for the night, where Nolly was. They were pretty tired by then, so they came back into the house. The dogs were hiding under the kitchen table, and couldn't be coaxed out, no matter what, which was worrisome. There had to be something out there, as they never acted like this. The rest of the night went okay, and nothing unusual happened. My grandfather went out a couple of times to check on everything and the second time the dogs went along and everything was fine. The next day my dad and the kid set off for school on Nolly and it was as if nothing had happened. When they got to school they could smell something awful and the teacher remarked on it wondering if anyone had any ideas what it could be. It smelled like something dead only 100 times as strong. By lunch, the smell was gone and the kids all went out into the schoolyard to eat their sack lunches. And the ones with the horses would lead them down for water. There were no problems until it was time to go back in for the afternoon. And that's when my dad said he saw something big and black down in the willow. Now, Hamilton really isn't bear country. As it's high desert, it's more like rattlesnake country and has little rock cliffs above it that are home to these snakes that sometimes come into town. I actually was riding my bike there once and ran next to what I thought was a stick and had a rattler hit my bike pedal. But bears? No way. It was too low and too hot. But my dad thought what he saw in the willows was a bear and he yelled for everyone to get inside then went running in to tell the teacher. He was the oldest kid in the school and the teacher sometimes relied on him for help with things like bringing in wood and helping with the younger kids. Miss Thomas made sure everyone was inside, then carefully looked out the window. The horses were running around the corral, all frantic, and she knew there was something wrong. But there wasn't much she could do about it. This was long before cell phones, and she didn't even have a regular phone. The kids were too excited to do schoolwork, so they all just kind of hunkered down while she and my dad went from window to window trying to see what was out there. My dad said Miss Thompson was the best teacher he ever had and very pragmatic. She knew the kids were overly excited and if the bear came up to the schoolhouse, she might have some hysterical kids on her hands, so she told them if they promised to not be afraid, she would read them a story. This was a real treat 
something they all loved and that she saved for special occasions like when they all got their work done early or were especially good. They were in the middle of reading Huckleberry Finn, so she started back in. In the meantime, while reading, she motioned my dad up to her desk. She whispered for him to go around and make sure all the windows were locked and to close the curtains so nothing could see in. Then to go and lock the door in the outer room. My dad did all this, but when he got to the back room, he decided to take a quick look outside and see if he could make anything out. He saw the horses had broken the top rails of the corral and were long gone. He knew they would go home and if the parents saw them, they would come looking for the kids and that would be a good thing. As he was stepping back in, he caught a glimpse just for a second of something dark going around the back of the school. He stood there watching, hoping to see what it was. He told me it happened so fast he couldn't believe it. But all of a sudden, the thing had come around the other side and was behind him. My dad was partway in the school, partway out, and this thing was almost on him before he managed to jump in and slam the door and lock it. It was long enough for him to get a good look at it. My dad would never really describe what he saw, except to say he wished he'd never seen it, because it gave him nightmares for years. He even talked about it when he was dying and regretted ever knowing the thing existed. It had a very profound impact on him. All he would say was that it was a human gorilla and very cunning. He went running back into the main room, but even though he was basically in shock, he didn't want to scare the kid, so he asked the teacher to come back with him. He wanted her to help him barricade the door, and he told her why. He said she was stunned, but seemed to believe him especially after the little girl said she had seen a gorilla. The creature never did bother them, but they were too terrified to go outside. So after they blocked the door, Miss Thomas just kept reading Huckleberry Finn. My dad told her the horses were gone and she knew sooner or later worried parents would show up. Sure enough, the first one to show was the mom of one of the kids who lived in town. She drove up to the school and promptly turned around and drove back into town, where she went into the little store there and told the owner there was a giant monkey at the schoolhouse. He got his shotgun and drove back with her, but didn't see anything. By then, another mom had shown up and knocked on the schoolhouse door, where Miss Thompson happily let her in between her and the other mom and the store owner. They managed to evacuate the school and take the kids back to the store. The store owner then went back to the school to tell the other parents what was going on when they showed up. Well, my grandma was next to show up and the store owner told her what had happened just as the creature let out a scream that shook the ground. You can bet they didn't stick around. Eventually, everything got sorted out and all the kids made it home. The consensus was to shut the school down until they could figure out what was going on. Since it was late spring already, it wasn't that big of a deal as this was back before school districts had school rules out the wazoo about how many days a kid had to be in school and all that. So that was the end of this thing terrorizing the schoolhouse. But it wasn't the end of its career in the area. It hung around for a month, going from ranch to ranch and scaring people. It never came back to our ranch. Although the kid said she saw it from the rear while it was climbing a nearby hill, but it did scare a lot of people. It would peek in windows and whack on the sides of houses. It would stampede livestock and go into barns and eat the horse's grain. It just ended up causing a lot of havoc and chaos. All the kids in the valley were kept indoors. Finally, everyone had had enough and a hunting party was put together. Everyone was terrified of it, and the horses wouldn't go near it. So my dad thought it was more to make everyone think something was being done. When in reality, nobody knew what to do. So about eight ranchers took off one morning on horseback, looking for what they were now calling Old Brown, a name they made up to not scare the kids when they talked about it. They rode up and down the valley, 
hunting through the willows with no luck. Finally, along at about sundown, someone saw it running up the side of a distant hill, and they all let go with their firepower. Though it was actually too far away to hit, my dad figured that it scared it away because it was never seen again. He told me that in Old Brown's defense, the creature never actually harmed anyone or anything, not even the calves that would have been so easy to kill. He figured it was old and hungry. Who knows, maybe it was the last of its kind in the area and lonely. But to his dying day, my dad said he wished he'd never seen the thing. On to the next one. I live on a river in southwest Missouri. My buddy and I decided to go night fishing one summer night. We paddled upriver in a canoe. It was a very quiet, still night, pitch black, no moon. All of a sudden, we heard a big splash about 20 yards in front of us. We thought it was weird, but shrugged it off and kept fishing. Then another one came and splashed not much further than the first one. It seemed to follow us upriver, four to five splashes before we turned around and headed back. We do have beaver on the river, and I'm familiar with their tail slap alert. This was not that. It sounded like good-sized rocks hitting the water. You could hear the punch of the water, the splash going up, and then raining back down. My buddy thought it was someone following us on the hillside, throwing rocks at us. I knew that couldn't be it because of the time of night. The fact that there is nothing up there but a few hundred acres of wood. And I also heard no footsteps. Whatever was chucking them had to be pretty far up that hillside. So a few years go by. That night was weird enough that I always remembered it. I was watching Paranormal Witness on TV where a grandpa and grandson went camping and they claimed a Bigfoot started throwing rocks at them while they were fishing. That was where I made the connection. I never believed in that stuff till then, and it really sparked my interest. I think the biggest evidence that makes me believe is not my experience is the fact that all eyewitnesses tell pretty much the same story. On to the next one. When I was in my younger years, I was probably 10 or 11 years old. It's of no consequence, but I was raised by my grandparents. They had a long walkway that went out the back door, and it went to a gazebo type of structure. It was dimly lit at night. In the country neighborhood that I lived in, a lot of stray dogs would come up and things like that, and my grandmother didn't like me feeding them, because the strays would stay. So, when some old raggedy dog would wander up and stuff, I'd pet it during the day and sneak out at night to feed it scraps and such on the gazebo. One time, this very matted thing showed up. I couldn't tell what kind of dog it was, but every night it would wait for me. When I walked out the back door, I could hear its paws hitting the wood on the floor of the gazebo, its tail wagging, and I would bring it food. One night, I went out there, and I looked in the corner where the dog would lay, and there was this dark mass. I took my little plate of food and approached what I thought was a dog until it stood up. And when it stood up, its head was almost to the rafters, and I saw the glowing eyes. I ran inside, never to come out at night for like a month and the old raggedy dog was gone. I knew I was awake and not sleepwalking, but whatever it was was very tall. It just stood up and looked at me. It didn't try to hurt me or anything, but that was the mass in the corner was not the same size as the dog. And sometimes I think that it was the imagination of a child, but I saw it. On to the next one. I live in Pueblo, Colorado. Me and my now wife lived in a five-acre home near the Arkansas River. We had one horse, a few chickens, 
two pigs and a bulldog. Well, one night, we had nephews over for the weekend. It was summer, mid-August, around midnight, on a Friday night. My nephews were up, playing video games. Me and the wife went to bed, and they came running to the room, saying they heard something near the bedroom window. My dog was barking at my back door, but he wasn't going close to the door like he normally does. I thought it was odd because he's very good about protecting the house. At that time of night, I knew it wasn't anyone or any neighbors. Over because we had two neighbors, one near the wooded area near the Arkansas River and one ten acres down the road, so the dog is going crazy. I hear something on my patio deck. It was moving fast near the door. I had my forty caliber. At the time, my wife and the kid had a baseball bat. The boys had good flashlights. So I told everyone to get their shoes on, and we went to the front door so we could sneak up on whatever was out there. We went around the side of the house real quick, but didn't get to see anything. We had a big barn about 50 feet from the house. We walked around, saw nothing. We went back in the house, and 10 minutes later, we hear something on the roof running around. At that point, my wife was really scared. So were the nephews, and I told them to stay inside. This time, me and the dog would go out, but my wife said she will go. She had my shotgun, and the boys again had the light. The running on the roof was so loud, my front door facing my horse field, and we see our horses running around like crazy toward her stable. We ran about 20 yards toward the house. Flashlights hit what we think is a huge sheepdog. But as we got closer, it turned around and it was on two legs. It had really long hair and yellow eyes. At that point, we had our guns pointed at it, but we were in shock at what we were looking at. This thing was around five feet tall, had arms and hands with nails or claws. It turned around and ran real fast. I fired a shot, not at it, but in the air. Me and my wife and the boys ran back to the house in shock. For about an hour, no one said a word. We just looked at each other and locked the whole house down. An hour later, my wife asked me and my nephews what they saw, but before they said anything, I told everyone to draw what they had seen. We all drew the same thing. A five-foot creature with long hair with two legs and arms with claws or long nails. It was an off-white. I can still see it like it were still there. Till this day, I wonder what the heck it was. On to the next one. I have a true story from when I was around 10 or 11 years old. So I was in the wood line around 50 feet from the community pool with my older brother, who was four years older than me. We climbed a crab apple tree that was full of bees, and my brother yelled out, what is that? I tried to see what he was pointing at, but couldn't see past the branches in front of my view. I was at least three feet above him, so I started to climb down. Halfway, I'm standing on the same branch he was sitting on. He said, stop, don't move. Then he lowered his voice to a whisper and said, look right there. And I see two little eyes close together, peeking from behind the main trunk of the tree. Its eyes were as round as quarters, and its face was peach in color. At first, I thought it was a monkey, but this was in Maryland. I said, ah, oh, it's a monkey. And my brother said, no, it isn't. It ran across the branch in front of me. It had shoes on its feet. Then I knelt down and leaned to the side to get a better look. And I did see a shoe and a short leg and a hand with tiny fingers. So we tried to catch it. Me from one side and my brother, already in motion, moving toward the other. We both missed it by inches and both watched it as it fell to the next branch down. We climbed down so fast, and I see it go into a hole at the base of the tree. My brother and I can see the hole went pretty far down in a slant. 
Both of us were on our bellies, trying to see in this hole. He got up and said, what was that? I stayed, covering the side of my eyes with my hand to have my eye adjust to see further back in the hole. Then I noticed something move right by the edge of the inside of the hole. So I reached my hand inside to grab it, and I touched it, and it jumped over my wrist and ran down the hole. It was a little chubby man with a head full of hair. Picture Hagrid from Harry Potter, but only four or five inches tall. We went back home, baffled, and grabbed a flashlight and went back, but never saw it again. I checked that hole every day for months. On to the next one. On a hot, sticky summer evening in central Maryland, a blue Nissan Pathfinder hurtled hastily down a curvy country road. It was Wednesday, piano lesson day for 14-year-old Sandra Kubler. Sandra's father, Mike, was driving her from the nearby suburbs to an area of big farms and fields for the weekly piano lesson with Miss Carter, a former conservatory pianist now living on the farm property with her husband, Dill, and providing lessons to students of all ages in her home studio. The division of labor at the Carter residence was rather pronounced. Dill Carter tended to the crops, Caroline Carter tended to the future Beethovens. Mike, a nearing middle-aged man, a fairly short stature and a slight paunch, and Sandra, a bright teen girl with long strawberry blonde hair, were racing to make the 7 p.m. lesson appointment with Miss Carter. It was about 6.57, and they weren't quite to the farm yet, despite having rapidly passed a milk tanker truck while in one of the dotted line passing zones of Route 31. The rural road was tree lined in spots with groups of large oaks, maples, and willows separated by expansive open fields of corn, alfalfa, and other vegetables. How's the Bach piece coming along? asked Mike of Sandra. Sandra had been working on Bach's Italian Concerto in F minor for a couple of weeks and didn't quite have it refined yet. She wasn't particularly looking forward to performing it in front of Mrs. Carter today. It's kind of lousy right now, replied Sandra, straightforwardly. I'm having some trouble with the second section. Ah, uh, you'll get it, said Mike, attempting a tone of encouragement. Sandra didn't mind the attempt, although she knew her dad had no idea how much focus and repetition it took to get a classical piece of music just right. She looked down at her phone screen and said, and will probably be late again, to her father with some resignation. Hmm, was his only reply, issued with a slight self-directed growl. On Route 31, about a mile past the country fairgrounds in wide open land, was a big mailbox with a black toy grand piano affixed to its top and a carved wooden rooster head jutting out of the mailbox front door. This signified the slightly bipolar Carter residence, encompassing both keys and crops. Turning right at the mailbox, Mike scooted onto and down the unpaved gravel driveway. The farmhouse was quite a distance back from the mailhouse. The driveway was extremely long and dusty, taking one slight curve to the right around a farm pond and some trees, then continuing for about another eighth of a mile to the Carter's farmhouse. Large, leafy trees ring the backside of the property. Mike Kubler liked the idea of keeping his pathfinder clean, but the weekly visit to the Carter farm made Mike's hopes for automotive cleanliness continually futile. After rolling down the long gravel driveway on this dry evening, the Pathfinder picked up a healthy coating of dust, particularly at the back of the vehicle. Oh well. The Carter farmhouse was a good-sized two-story home, situated not far from a green barn. It was clear which structure belonged to whom. The farmhouse reflected the refined, elegant sensibilities of a woman, while the barn housed a tractor tools, fertilizer bags, and other accoutrements of agricultural activity. 
Mike and Sandra came to a stop in front of the house, and Sandra took a quick jump out of the SUV and jogged toward her lesson, carrying her music book. This was always a somewhat anxious moment for Sandra, particularly when she and her dad were on the late side of things. Back in the car, Mike sat still for a few moments and caught his breath after yet another dad duty done, if not gracefully or quite on time. After a few minutes, Mike followed Sandra into a side door of the house. Within a sizable foyer with a slate floor, wicker-style furniture, and large potted houseplant served as a waiting area for the piano parents, while double wooden doors closed during lessons led to Miss Carter's music studio. As in a medical office, small stacks of magazines for those who were in the wait were situated on the end tables between chairs. Miss Carter's music studio was a pleasant, expansive air-conditioned room with tan walls and large windows that let in plenty of sunlight, along with the views of the farm and the woods beyond. Studio adornments, including the requisite mementos of a musical life, two music degree diplomas on the wall, a stackable music rack with numerous songbooks, metronomes, and other instructional devices, and a few small ornamental bursts of Mozart, Beethoven, and other great composers perched atop cabinets. Against the back wall was a brown seven-foot Kawai concert grand piano. The large instrument was situated such that entering the room and walking toward the piano would bring one straight to the keyboard, a direct inviting path to music making. Sandra sat up straight on the piano bench, finishing her performance of her Bach concerto. Miss Carter sat immediately next to her in a separate chair, listening and observing closely. Carolyn Carter was a slight, lean woman with dark shoulder-length hair. Wearing a khaki pair of shorts and a floral patterned short sleeve top, she was neat, studious-looking, and alert with her dark-rimmed glasses and a red pen in hand. After Sandra finished the Bach piece, Miss Carter marked up several sections and offered advice on how Sandra might get through the tougher section a bit more smoothly. However, even though she was exacting in her instructions and expectations of the students, she also had a good sense of humor and strove to maintain a friendly rapport, not wanting to inhabit the cranky, ego-driven educator category. Well, I guess that's all the fun for this week, she said in a chipper fashion to Sandra, standing up to emphasize the lesson's closure. She added, Oh, and on the Chopin waltz, try to watch those tempo marks. You don't want Frederick to leave you in the ditch on that one. Sandra giggled slightly and let out a breath of relief at the lesson's end. Okay, I'll do that, she said to Mrs. Carter. A student and teacher walked toward the double doors to the foyer. Miss Carter opened one of the doors and saw her husband, Dill, standing next to Sandra's father, clearly immersed in a rather serious exchange. And so, we all need to be a little careful, Dill was saying to Mike at the apparent conclusion of a discussion. Dill was a tall, well-built man with a fairly prominent nose and just a bit of gray showing at the ends of his short brown hair. A baseball cap in hand, he looked over a pair of glasses that were well down his nose as he spoke earnestly to Sandra's father. Mrs. Carter hesitated to broach what she thought might be the apparent topic among the men, but she did it anyways. So, what's up, Dill? All was quiet for a few moments between the four people. It's that thing we've been hearing, and other folks have seen over the last few weeks, Dill finally said to the group. Sandra quickly realized that she had no idea at all what the adults were talking about. Her father clued Sandra into the discussion after seeing her understandable lack of comprehension. They'd been encountering a, a creature here recently, and Mr. Carter was recommending some caution as we're coming and going, Mike said. A creature? exclaimed Sandra, as if she could have asked anything else. Yes, began Dill. We don't want to scare you too much, but there's something big around here. That got my neighbors pretty spooked. One neighbor lost a few chickens to it, 
and another guy had his two dogs so scared that he can barely get them outside now, Dill explained. What do you think it is? Sandra directly asked Dill. More strained silence ensued. Caroline Carter looked particularly uncomfortable at having to impart news of a disturbing, fully mysterious threat. She tipped her head down and idly scratched at her ear. Some think it's a migrating Bigfoot or something that at least temporarily hanging around, said Dill at last. A Bigfoot? said Sandra quickly, looking to her father with amazement, eyes fully wide. Mrs. Carter strove to add some perspective. I've never been a believer in the legend, she said with obvious reluctance, but we've been hearing sounds at night that are unlike any sounds I've ever heard. Long, mournful howls that have incredible power and duration to them. Dill and I have always been around animals, but this is something else entirely. But you still haven't seen it, asked Mike. No, we've had no visuals to date, said Dill. Just the howls at night right here. But the neighbors have seen a huge dark figure right at the tree line at dusk. Then, right after, they heard the same sort of howls as we did coming out of the forest. He paused for a few moments, then added. Plus, Jim Chappelle had a chicken coop ripped open and raided. Wow, exclaimed Sarah, who had some scant knowledge of Bigfoot, but didn't know what to expect should there be one in the vicinity. A, a monster right here? Well, we're not completely sure, began Mrs. Carter, but we want everyone to keep their eyes open when they're in the area. Mr. Kubler wasn't quite on board with the neighborhood monster theory. Uh, there's no way I buy into the Bigfoot stories, he said. But if you guys think there might be a threat, then sure, we'll look out. And we just heard it last night, added Dill, looking especially downcast over having to remind everyone of the proximity of the potential menace. More silence ensued as each individual settled further into the highly unusual nature of the discussion and what it might mean for each of them. Well then, said Mike, I guess we'll get going. Thanks, I guess. He offered an uncertain sideways grin to the Carters and put his arm around Sandra, who was carrying her music book. They headed out the side door as they took their first step into the very fragrant late evening air of the country, both Sandra and Mike reflexively scanned the area visually. Their steps were a bit quicker than usual as they headed for the SUV. In fact, Sandra nervously ran the last few steps to the car. Back inside, Carolyn had a tense discussion with Dill as they walked toward their kitchen. Do you think we really should have told them about it? She asked. Dill thought for several moments. Yeah, he started. I figured Mike might not believe me, but I'd be remiss if I didn't tell them to at least be aware of their surroundings here. I don't know what that thing's capable of or what it's really after. As the weight of the situation sunk further into Caroline's consciousness, she said, I just feel terrible about scaring a young girl like that when we're not 100% sure what we're dealing with. I feel bad too, said Dill. But I'd feel worse if something happened and we hadn't told them about this darn thing. Caroline at once experienced an ugly, unpleasant jolt in the pit of her stomach. Oh God, I need a drink, she said finally. Since Sandra's was the last lesson of the day and the workday on the farm had ended some time before, Caroline and Dill headed for the liquor cabinet together to address their mutual discomfort. Mike and Sandra were now rolling down the Carter's long driveway toward Route 31. It was nearly dark, and although the landscape was a deep green and beautiful in the fading sunlight, a palpable feeling of dread enveloped both the car's passengers. Do you really think it's possible? asked Sandra. Mike hesitated several seconds. I don't know, probably not, but the Carters are some smart people and they'd have no reason to make something like that up, he reasoned out loud. The rest of the world seemed to have temporarily dropped away as father and daughter each thought through various Sasquatch scenarios. You know, your box sounded darn good to me tonight, said Mike, out of the blue, 
striving to summon additional encouragement while also trying to change the subject. Sandra would have none of it. What would a Bigfoot do with chickens? Sandra went on to ask, obviously still reviewing the Carter's account in her mind. Um, eat them, I guess, answered Mike as the car neared the big bend in the driveway. Envisioning Bigfoot poultry violence, Sandra got a chill on this otherwise hot, humid night. Just as they approached the clump of trees at the leftward bend of the gravel driveway, they both observed an extremely large, dark man seemingly come out of nowhere, taking huge strides and crossing the driveway from right to left in two steps, only about 30 feet in front of the car. The man lowered his head somewhat and swiftly ducked into the trees adjacent to the pond. Having barely missed the figure with his SUV, Mike yelled, Holy jeez! At the same moment, Sandra let out a short scream at the imposing, confusing, unexpected sight. Mike instinctively jammed hard on the brakes and the SUV began skidding roughly in the gravel, the wheels having largely come to a stop, although the car was still moving. Fortunately, the car wasn't traveling too quickly, so Mike turned a bit to the right and the car slid noisily through the rocks and off the driveway, coming to a stop and skidding askew in some long grass. The SUV's engine, now somewhat mechanically traumatized, stalled and went quiet. Sandra and Mike briefly sat in stunned silence as all motion ceased, except for the billowing of a big cloud of dust caused by the skidding vehicle. It was almost shocking quite for a moment after the car came to a complete stop and the engine shut down. With hearts racing, Mike and Sandra tried to regain their senses and figure out what to do. Who was that? asked Sandra. Mike sat still for several seconds with hands tightly gripping the steering wheel, trying to look through the dust cloud toward the trees in order to assess the situation. He ultimately said, I think it may have been the visitor that the Carters were talking about. Now that her initial, although self-denied impression of the figure was confirmed in reality by her father, Sandra was totally terrified. The norms of suburban and rural life had been shattered by the appearance of something scary from an unknown realm, and it was right behind the small stand of trees next to the family SUV. As the dust began to clear, it soon became clear to the two people in the car that they were not alone at this otherwise beautiful spot of evening's end in the country. Both Sandra and Mike had their windows most of the way down, and the sound each of them then heard with total clarity sent daggers through their nervous systems. The roar started at a very low pitch, but within three or four seconds, began to rise up to a combination of a weightlifter's yell and a lion's aggressive outburst. It was coming from the trees right next to the car. Both Sandra and Mike instantly felt all their muscles clench in a shocking reaction to the gargantuan growl. Neither of them had heard any sounds like this in their lives. The deep roar rippled across the landscape with such sonic power that it seemingly stopped all the bird chirping, cicada buzzing, and spring pepper frog frolicking within several miles. Sandra and Mike essentially were frozen by the monstrous sound. Dad, we need to go, cried Sandra loudly. Mike was still utterly stunned and virtually insensate after the powerful jolt of Sasquatch infrasound struck him. He struggled to gather himself and resume operating the vehicle. He reached toward the ignition key, but his wobbly hand aimlessly impacted the dashboard without constructive result. Come on, Dad, Sandra strongly implored as her dad continued to fumble with the controls. Just then, Sandra glanced in her passenger side rearview mirror and got the overwhelming shock of her life. The gigantic creature had apparently circled back out of the trees and was now striding purposefully up behind the car. In other words, an object in the mirror was definitely closer than it appeared. Daddy, go, Sandra screamed with every ounce of vocal energy she could muster. The urgency of this child-emitted directive finally pushed Mike out of his stupor and into action. 
He successfully grabbed the key and turned it, and pressed down on the gas pedal. Fortunately, the Pathfinder roared to life once more. Sandra felt immeasurable relief upon hearing the engine start. Unfortunately, she simultaneously looked in the mirror again and did not appreciate the image therein. What she saw in the mirror was a seven or eight foot tall bipedal creature that was moving forward with a driven, insistent force and a palpable sense of predatory power. The creature was far bigger than any man or woman Sandra had ever seen in her life. It had long, dark brown or black hair from head to foot, flowing backward as the creature ran. Its large, clearly visible face was human-like, though also gorilla-like, a cross between the known and the wild. But the animal's enormity was the most mind-blowing characteristic of this beast for Sandra. The sight was straight out of a nightmare. But here it was, right by a picturesque farmhouse after a piano lesson. Sandra could clearly make out the creature's huge leg and arm muscles as it ran forward toward the as-yet motionless car. The creature now produced a low, continuous bouncing growl as it neared the vehicle. Just after the car roared to life, Sandra began to scrunch down in her seat because of the charging creature was now so very close to her. Just beyond the passenger side open window, Mike punched the gas and the back of the car swished as the vehicle strove to gain traction. The SUV quickly lurched forward and went around the driveway bend by the trees. Dust and gravel flew everywhere behind the car. Oh God, thanks, Dad, Sandra yelled over the whining, accelerating engine. Focusing on trying to steer the car accurately, Mike soon deadpanned. Yeah, no problem at all, honey. Despite the car having managed forward progress, Sandra quickly realized that they were not out of the woods yet, so to speak. Upon looking in the rearview mirror again, Sandra saw that the forest creature had aggressively sped up and caught the SUV. It was right behind the car now, and Sandra could see a seemingly angry face atop a gigantic monster body charging forward. This wasn't in any way over. Suddenly, Mike and Sandra experienced a deeply uncomfortable lurch as, Visible to Sandra in the mirror, the agile creature reached out, spread its arms, and pushed down on the back of the vehicle with its big hand. The human's head bounced violently backward as the powerful downward force was exerted upon the car. The terror inspired by the jolt from the monster's muscles was immediately disoriented to both car passengers. Thoughts of imminent death materialized quickly. Upon regaining his equilibrium, Somewhat after the startling downward jolt, Mike basically floored it as he steered the car toward the end of the driveway. The monster was still intently pursuing them. Mike sped up. Finally, as they approached the end of the driveway, Sandra could see the monster had fallen back. Fifty or eighty feet behind the SUV, it was still running at full tilt, but as Sandra hoped, nearing the end of its pursuit, with the car beginning to get out of reach. Thank goodness for direct fuel injection and thick cylinders in the SUV engine. Now the mailbox was straight ahead. Knowing he'd need to make a very agile left-hand turn, Mike swung just a little toward the right of the driveway and, upon arriving at the piano, Rooster mailbox executed a skillful leftward swing of the car without stopping to view the cross traffic as prescribed by proper vehicular protocol out onto Route 31. The physical relief was immediate for both Mike and Sandra as they felt the tires finally grip solid pavement beneath the vehicle. Sandra turned back and took one last look backward, this time through the rear seat window of the car behind her father. The Bigfoot had pulled up to a halt just prior to the mailbox and seemed to be relegated to watching the vehicle escape its grasp. Sandra saw the creature stop and lower its fist down towards its knees to issue one final aggressive roar. Even though the car's engine was working hard, Sandra and Mike both heard the Sasquatch's roar atop it. The sound was both angry and desolate, indicating that the uncertain motivation of the creature as it pursued father and daughter down the dust-driven driveway. Even from a distance, the Sasquatch sound was like a gut punch. 
Had the creature been hungry for humans, or was it partial to Bach and simply wanted to hear more music, or did it dislike the blue Nissan vehicle? No one could know for sure at this point. However, at this moment, the prospect of likely survival was the most satisfying feeling Sandra had experienced thus far in her young life. Mike was still totally focused on directing the car at high speeds toward safety. Neither he nor Sandra verbalized anything for a minute or two as they hurtled down Route 31 toward home. The car's engine was getting quite a workout as it propelled the vehicle toward the familiar structures and shapes of the suburb. Finally, Sandra said to her father in a low, quiet voice, Uh, I can't believe that just happened. She was still shaking all over. Mike exhaled deeply and felt his tense muscles relax just a little bit. He felt tears forming at the edge of his eyes. Me neither, sweetheart, he said. Mike reached over with his right hand and gently caressed the back of Sarah's neck. She closed her eyes and reveled in the familiar, reassuring touch. Having driven another mile or so in silence, Mike abruptly piped up in a perky manner. You know, Sandy, I'm getting really tired of Bach, he said, with a feigned air of authority analysis. I don't think we'll be coming out for piano lessons for a while, okay? Sandra simply replied, that's music to my ears, Dad. On to the next one. In 1973, audiences worldwide flocked to their local movie theaters to watch the story of a young girl struggle with a demonic possession named Pazuzu. Based on the international bestseller, Written by William Peter Blatty, the motion picture The Exorcist broke all records. However, even during the filming, actors, producers, and the director wondered if they were negatively harming their young star, Linda Blair. Until that time, no one in the film would ever heard an innocent blurt out so many colorful metaphors. There was more going on with the set of this motion picture than anyone at the time was willing to acknowledge. Something was there. Something more than just Hollywood magic. The novel, upon which the motion picture was based, held an impressive record on the New York bestseller list for over 55 weeks. However, at that time, no one but a few knew that the story was based on an actual exorcism in St. Louis, Missouri, in 1949. After several attempts, Warner Brothers obtained the motion picture right and set aside four million dollars to make the film, a significant amount for a horror movie at the time. Due to the special effects and the problems therein, the total cost of making the film was over 12 million. There were also problems with the cast and crew namely a lot of death. Death is the way of the world. However, to have so many unnatural deaths associated with such a temporary thing as making a movie put the toll linked to making The Exorcist high above the national norm. There were at least nine recorded deaths related to the making of this movie. Not one person connected with the film escaped life's lasting just over a month before the final day of shooting, actor Jack McGowan died due to complications related to the flu. He was only 55. His character, the often drunk director in love with Reagan's mother, had been killed by the girl after the demon possessed her. His character was pushed out of the bedroom window, landing at Georgetown's now famous row of steps. The 90-year-old actress, Veliski Malaroth, who played Father Karras' mother, died before the film's release. Three years after the movie's release, in 1976, actor Lee J. Cobb, who played the film's loving detective in the story, died of a heart attack at 64. Even the two primary stars of the movie had a connection with the Grim Reaper. 
it was rumored that Max von Sydow, who played Father Marin, had a brother who passed away in Sweden, though thought to be a rumor. Sydow stated he has no siblings, and Linda Blair lost a grandparent while in production. If this were not bad enough, even the crew of the film had bad luck. It was later revealed that a wife of the cameraman gave birth to a stillborn child. In addition, the technician responsible for the severe cold effects died. Finally, an African-American night watchman and the actor Linda Blair's character urinated in front of, stating, you're going to die up there, all met mysterious ends. There was not a week that went by during the filming that something did not happen. While shooting the famous pea soup vomit scene, Jason Miller was informed that his son had been hit by a motorcycle. Thankfully, the child survived. During the infamous scene with a cross, actress Ellen Burstein was struck by Linda Blair and hit the ground with a terrible scream. There was no acting in this incident. The cry was genuine. Miss Burstein received a permanent injury to her spine due to a malfunction of the harness she was wearing. In theory, the harness was to be used to enhance the illusion of Reagan's demonic possession by giving the girl superhuman strength, thereby having the ability to slap her mother across the room. All went well during the rehearsal. Every safety contingency was taken. However, upon filming, something went wrong. The harness malfunctioned. Ellen Burstein landed upon her coccyx, causing nerve damage. The damage, as stated, was permanent. The sets for the film had to be individually built by people specializing in refrigeration. Incredibly massive air conditioners were installed in the bedroom scenes to help give the illusion of breath and a cold, eerie feeling. At one particular point in filming, everything was halted for a day because it snowed on the set. There was so much moisture from the heat and sweat of the actors that started down as a snowstorm. It was reported in the filming logs that the set was sometimes set as low as negative 30 or negative 40 degrees. While building the set, although it cannot be substantiated, a carpenter was said to have accidentally cut off several of his fingers. If this were not enough to convince the suspicious, when all had gone home after an incredibly long shooting week, the set caught fire, burning to the ground. The release of the film was delayed because the Georgetown set had been reduced to ashes. The fire's cause remains a mystery to this day. The cast and crew had enough. The director requested a Roman Catholic priest to help perform an exorcism on the film set. Since the Catholic Church believed that only people could be possessed by a demon and not inanimate things, the request was refused. However, a blessing was given and some fears were calmed. William Peter Blatty was even affected by the film. Blatty's ex-wife reported she saw on several separate occasions the telephone rising off its hook and dropping down to the living room floor on its own accord. At first, the best-selling author had his doubts. Then, one night while reaching for a pack of cigarettes, he saw the phone shake gently, rise out of its resting place, hover, and then drop off its hook bouncing to the floor. An earthquake could not have caused this. These were the old and bulky Ma Bell phones. Nevertheless, the sight of this unexplainable phenomenon made Blatty pause. Billy Graham proclaimed to all that the forces of darkness seemed aligned with the movie and that there was a power of evil within it. Unfortunately, some heeded his warnings and have yet to gather the courage to see the movie to this day. While filming the movie, actor Jason Miller lived at the Jesuit housing, hoping to gain enough atmosphere for his role. While in a restaurant nearby, a priest introduced himself, giving the man an ancient medallion depicting the Virgin Mary with child. 
he gave the medal to Mr. Miller with this warning. If anyone does anything to reveal the devil for the trickster he is, he will seek retribution against you, or he will even try to stop what you are doing to unmask him. One last fact, the director, when finished with the film, took it to a production company for final editing in New York City. The firm's address was 666 Fifth Avenue. It is said that the devil is a trickster. He loves playing the game. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!